So if you want to start the record. Cheers. Thanks, Anna. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for uh, for joining me this morning. I'm glad that we will have a good group. And I expect to have a good conversation because that is what I want to have uh, this morning is a conversation with y'all. But I'm going to begin with the uh, the land acknowledgement statement. And, and I'll say it, Liz, like you don't even have to, like somebody else will be able to say it for a change. The State University of New York at Oswego would like to recognize with respect the Onondaga Nation the people of the hills or the central fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral lands Suni Oswego now stands. Please join me in acknowledging the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora nations, their elders both past and present, as well as the future, future seven generations yet to come. Consistent with university values of diversity and equity, inclusion and social justice, this acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to cultivating relationships with Native American communities through academic collaborations, partnerships, historical recognitions, and community service in order to dismantle the legacies of conquest and colonization. I like to say that, and I'm proud that we say that um, on our campus here at SUNY Oswego. And um, I won't talk specifically so much about uh, what the acknowledgement means, but I hope to give it um, a greater context in terms of names and namings and in terms of terms and terminologies. Um, I don't think I have to um, talk about how important names and naming is. I don't think I have to talk about how important terms and terminologies are with a group that would show up to a panel like this but that's what this conversation is going to focus on. And I know I wasn't clever enough to have this as the actual title of the talk. There is no I in BIPOC, but that's what it should have been. I think I had something like um, the I in BIPOC, but um, this is a much more clever title and we'll get um, specifically and directly at what I wanna speak about today. Um, I chose this image before the horrific events in Texas. I, I wasn't trying to trigger people. Um, this image, I, I worked at the Onondaga Nation School for many years, which is a K through eight um, school throughout my entire um, graduate studies and into my PhD studies. And so this is the sixth, seventh and eighth grade students from the Onondaga Nation School on the first trip that they ever took to Washington DC. That annual trip to Washington DC for eighth graders, or maybe in my school it was seventh and eighth graders, we went once every two years. That was a big deal in junior high to, to go to the White House, to go to Ford's Theater, to go to Arlington National Cemetery, to go to some of the museums on campus. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to chaperone the sixth, seventh and eighth graders from the Onondaga Nation School. On their trip, we went to those historical places, but maybe you can understand that um, the Onondaga Nation, they didn't have a tradition of going down to Washington, D.C. They don't consider Washington, D.C. to be their nation's capital. In fact, many Haudenosaunee people have, um, let's just say, complicated ideas about what they think about the United States federal government, as well as what they think about the state of New York. These kids showed an almost eerie fascination with the events of the, um, the German Holocaust. We are in the basement here of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum on the mall in Washington, DC. And if any of you have ever visited the USHMM, you know it is a very um, dark museum space. It's a very confusing museum space. It's a very visceral industrial museum space. It's meant to make you feel uncomfortable, a, a physical feeling of uncomfortability as you're learning about um, the destruction of Jewish peoples, uh, the destru destruction of Catholic peoples, the destruction of Roma peoples, the destruction of Polish peoples, the liquefaction of homosexuals. These kids wanted to go and see it. These kids wanted to learn. They were much more interested, for example, in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum than they were in the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian. 
all they cared about at the Museum of the American Indian was the gift shop <laughs> or the, the food too. They have a good food court there. What they wanted to see at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum wasn't only the exhibits, but it was this gentleman, uh, Manny. Manny is a Holocaust survivor uh, originally from Budapest. And he survived the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, emigrated to Israel, and then to the United States eventually. Uh, there are survivors um, who are telling their tales with small groups of people 24-7, 365 at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It's part of the deal. Uh, when I learned that the children were going to go and wanted to go, I immediately signed my, me and my then girlfriend up to, to go visit the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. When I told my parents, who live in Chicago, <laughs> that we were going to visit the United States Holocaust Museum with um, the 6th, 7th, and 8th graders from the Onondaga Nation School, they flew from Chicago <laughs> with my sister to meet us there. Um, and we kind of just snuck them in at the end of the lunch. We actually got let in early to the museum. We got a half, we got a half hour in a half hour early on some kind of, you know, special like uh, these, these, these kids from the Onondaga Nation School are visiting. And I just kind of snuck my parents into the end of the line with us because we knew that it was going to be important that just this moment, the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders from ONS visiting the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum was something that me and my family, my parents, and my sister wanted to experience. I'm telling a story a bit like my father, because there is no point to this story. It's just a moment. It's just a moment in time that I happen to have a picture of, that when I think about tough conversations, when I think about brutal events happening in the news, that I have a moment to return to that is a triumphant moment. And I hope you understand that this is a moment of triumph. Me and my family being able to share with the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders from the Onondaga Nation School, being able to share here with this survivor from Budapest, Manny. And you can see this intricate medallion that the kids beaded for him. And it's, in, it's a menorah. And that's not a very um, ubiquitous symbol throughout Judaism and Jewish history. But they were going to make him a Menachem star, a star of David. <laughs> and I saw the design pattern before they had started the beadwork. And I was like, you know. It's you're making it for a survivor. Like you might not, he might, he might feel some kind of way about the physical symbol of a, a star of Dave. And they were like, good call, Hannes. Good call. It, it's important to have a Jewish person on staff for this very reason. Now, I, I messed up to tell you the truth. Manny would have loved it. <laughs> he actually talked about the fact that he had lost somewhere along the way his Yudin star. Yes, that yellow star that Jewish people were forced to wear on their clothing in order to identify themselves when they were out, when they had the audacity to be out in public. He had lost it somewhere along the way and that he would have liked to have it. So Manny would have been cool with it, but it is funny to me that Manny has this beautiful giant medallion <laughs> in the shape of a menorah uh, because I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I will try to stop talking though. I only have... One, one more slide. Well, two, but one is in, just in case. So like I said, this is a moment that I, I return to, a moment of triumph when conversations are difficult, when situations are rough, and when um, I am requested and demanded to, um, to administer difficult talks and difficult conversations. I don't expect that this, this session will be difficult. I want this to be a conversation amongst ourselves. And really, it's much more for y'all than it is for me. Y'all are the ones who showed up to a, to a, a, a talk, to a session in, entitled, There Is No I in BIPOC. So you must want to get something out of it. Um, so I'm going to read this list. But I hope as, as you're looking at this list, you're thinking about these two questions. Which of these terms and terminologies do you feel comfortable using? Which of these terms and terminologies do you feel uncomfortable using? Because as soon as I get through this list, I'm going to open up the floor for conversation because I want to talk about um, first, the terms and terminologies you feel uncomfortable with. And then second, the, maybe the terms and terminologies that you feel uh, comfortable. You Well, well for, let's, let's do comfortable first. That's, that's easier. 
first I'll ask you the question, which of these terms and terminologies do you feel comfortable using as part of your vernacular? And next I'll ask, which of these terms and terminologies do you feel uncomfortable using? So the, this is just my list. Um, this is a list that I have garnered over the years um, throughout uh, various, throughout research in the history of religions, anthropology, uh, sociology, um, the history of Christianity, popular culture, American Indian, Aboriginal, ancient, archaic, backward, barbarian, basic, brave, cold cultures, cultures of contact, colored races, first nations, Indian, infidel, indigenous, neolithic, Indian, native, Native American, non-civilized, non-literate, exotic, heathen, lower races, minor, native, original, ungwe hungwe, oppressed cultures, oral, pagan, primal, primeval, primitive, prehistoric, preliterate, Saracen, savage, semi-savage, savage races, squaw, submerged, subaltern, skin, tribal, and or uncivilized, fort Indians, urban Indians, city Indians, sidewalk Indians, superficial, inauthentic, cultureless refugees, and apples. Okay, so um, I can see all your boxes. You're not just boxes to me. <laughs> I can see all your bricks and I can see the chat as well. So in a second here, I promise I'm gonna go on mute and I'll just want someone to either jump into the chat or you can go off mute and speak into the space. Like I said, we're gonna cover um, the second prompt here first. I, they're out of order. What terms and terminologies from this list, what terms and terminologies do you feel comfortable using? I'm going to talk. This is Sandy because I talk faster than I type. Um, American Indian, First Nations, Native American. Whoa, slow down, Sandy. <laughs> but thank you. And then we saw a few of these in the in the side. Um, okay, right on. Indigenous, so, indigenous, I like. Let's take American Indian and Native American first, because I, I am the director of, sorry, my name is Michael Chanis. I teach in the Department of Anthropology. I'm a visiting assistant professor, and I'm also the director of Native American Studies. So I'm the director of Native American Studies. It says it right on my door. I teach classes in NAS, Native American Studies. I do this exercise or an exercise slightly like this in my NAS 100 Introduction to Native American Studies. But I got to tell you, from all my experience, you know, the people we're talking about are not native to America. They're actually quite foreign to America, to the ethics, to the values, to the religious worldview, to the um, conception of the group versus the conception of the individual. Calling them Native American, you might as well call them foreign Americans, as, as well as you're calling them Native Americans, as a specific term and terminology. Now, American Indian. American Indian is uh, one very relate. The two most acceptable academic terms, I think, are Native American and American Indian. American Indian actually comes out of the 1960s and 1970s. The American Indian movement, a kind of pan-Indian political and religious economic educational movement. But like, they're neither American nor are they Indian, right? I mean, we'll get to Indian, I'm sure in a bit. But Indian is a misnomer. Indian is false. Indian comes from Columbus and the conquistadors thinking when they arrived in the Caribbean that they had actually hit India and started calling these people Indians and that the name stuck for 500 years. So, you know, I know in math, two negatives can make a positive, but like they're neither American nor are they Indian. So putting those two terms together seems a bit strange as well. Now, I'm not picking on you, Sandy. <laughs> like I'm not picking on you, Liz. I'm not picking on you, Marat. These are, these are just the terms and terminology. I teach in the department. So indigenous, Karen, thank you. And Liz, thank you. Um, 
Jacqueline, thank you. Indigenous is another one. But when you think about it, indigenous has a problem because it's very vague. There are indigenous people from North America. There are indigenous people from South America. There are indigenous people from Africa, Australia, Asia, everywhere. Everywhere people are local. Everywhere people are folk. So indigenous is just this really broad term encompassing probably hundreds of millions, if not billions of people from all over the world with radically different geographies, radically different religious systems, radically different linguistic systems. And so it, it kind of diffuses itself almost into nothingness in a way. If you're talking about indigenous, then you're talking about people from all over the globe. And that's certainly not what I do in my classes. I don't talk about indigenous people from Africa, Australia, Asia. I don't even talk about indigenous people from South America. So the term, at least for, for me and for folks in my studies, it, it sort of diffuses its use as well. Or at least it's problematic in its vagaries. Uh, First Nations. Thank you, Jackie. And uh, Jackie, are you Canadian? Ah, see, like, I don't, I see you nodding. I appreciate it. Yeah, Jackie, because you know why? Because the Canadian always says First Nations, because First Nations is how folks refer to um, the indigenous folks from Canada. It's not a term that's um, popular in, in sort of the American English lexicon. You know, this is something that's funny, too. If you want to think of how interesting the term Native American is, or why that might have sounded right before this, but why it sounds funny now, think about this term, Native Canadian. You know, Michael, thought, this is Sandy. I learned about First Nations from, a, you know, I taught at SU and I had a First Nations student in my class who went to the Haudenosaunee Longhouse. And that's how I learned about that term. She was very you know, diligent that we, we use that term. So. Yeah, that's the preferred, no, that is the Native American or the American Indian of Canada. Mm -hmm. um, the preferred academic nomenclature, let's say. Is that it? Is that all the ones that folks feel comfortable? Have I, have I shot down every one of these that folks feel comfortable with? Surely you must be a Hi. So this is Nicole. I'm in, I'm in the cell room right now. I was going to say what, what I feel comfortable using is what, what folks ask me to use. Like I, so fro so Haudenosaunee is one that I've been asked to use before. And so I tend to default to like a nothing without us approach. I really so I appreciate like no, I really appreciate that, Nicole. And we're not getting ahead of ourselves, but I do have to ask a follow-up, Nicole. Well, first I'll say this. If you know Ungwe Hungwe people, they'll tell you. <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> even, the fact, even the fact that we have to have this conversation, it's a bit illustrative of the fact that y'all don't know because y'all don't know Ungwe Hungwe people, or at least you haven't been the minority in a group of majority Ungwe Hungwe people long enough to know what they prefer. And I get asked this question all the time. I'm not poking fun. I have had to figure out how to respond to the question, what do they like to be called? And that's part of the, the basis of this, of this conversation. Uh, Nicole, so I do have to ask the follow-up because you brought us here already. Have, have you or anyone else spent enough time with Native people to know what terms and terminologies they use in private as opposed to when they're the minority in public? I would say when I've been in spaces, it's mostly been digital and they tend to use the, the two that look very digital on your list when I'm around, the NDN and the native. Um, but I have not been around um, when in, in person, mostly, unless I am on um, like the Haudenosaunee lands, the Onondaga Nation area where I do have 
um, white friends who live there. So even then it's, it's incidental. Yeah, I spent a long time at Onondaga. So that's where the, that, that is where the question, that is where the answer will come from, Nicole. And I appreciate you bringing up, uh, Nicole was talking about these two, capital N, capital D, capital N, and then capital N, and then eight I-V-E. And that's really like Indian Twitter shorthand. Like if you see people talking about Ungwe Hungwe people in social media, this is often how it will be abbreviated. And you don't know unless you know. And Nicole is saying, yeah, I know. The, I know those. Those look familiar to me. Uh, anyone else? I don't want to pick on Nicole. Does, has anyone, um, does anyone know what, how Native people refer to themselves in private? I mean, I've actually, I guess I wouldn't say in private, but I've actually asked. So there was years ago, I'm in graduate school and there's a talk show and the talk show is centering around, you know, Redskin and Cleveland Indians and these kinds of things. Um, and um, there were opposing groups talking and then a woman who people were referring to as Native American, someone said, well, what do you like to be called? And she made this comment, so like, well, you loop in the United States, we just group together Cherokee or Cree or Choctaw. And she's like, and those are different nations. And so really, you know, you should be finding out what nation and, and referring it. And I know, you know, Kevin White was here and he would refer to himself as Mohawk. And uh, sometimes the students say, well, is Dr. White, you know, is he Indian or is he Native American? I say, I would usually answer he's Mohawk. And, um, you know, so just so, sort of gently saying, you know, the nations aren't interchangeable um, necessarily. So I guess that was one of the things I noticed. But one of the things that drove me here was, um, oh, my dog would like you to know that there's a package arriving. So, so, well, and they're not going to murder us because she won't let it happen. Um, anyway, so the, the idea here is that in, on this talk show, um, woman, Native American woman, for lack of a better word right now, to say, was saying, well, these are names that you have given us. And, you know, because some people were saying, well, what should we call you or what is the right term or what's not insulting? Um, and um, I thought, well, that's really, so she didn't really give us a term. And so now I'm like, well, now I don't know how to refer to a group when you don't know. Um, and, and then that gets really awkward because you mentioned, Michael, the power of naming. And so if you don't know, and this even happens with students outside the US when you don't know how to pronounce their name. And so they'll often say, oh, you can call me Jennifer. I'm like, no, I'll learn how to pronounce your name. If this is your name, I'll learn how to pronounce your name. And just even on our campus, Provoker went from his nickname of PK to using his full name. And why shouldn't he? And why shouldn't we learn to pronounce someone's names? And it's, you know, it's this basic sign of respect to learn how to say someone's name or to, you know, to characterize them as, as, as they wish to be characterized. And so what brought me here is I think this is a difficult problem because um, you have a population that's stuck with names that we decided to give them. And, and, and how do you decide to, um, and, what, and what kind of guidance you get about um, the name that they would want. I really appreciate that, Liz. And I, I wanna respond to a few things you said but I will, I am, I hate this term, but I am going to put a pin in the, okay, so what do you like to be? Like, I will get, I will get to that. Okay. It probably won't be an, a satisfactory answer for a professor of economics, <laughs> I will, but I promise you, I you will get it. to it. <laughs> I, 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 it's coming, it's coming, okay. but, it, but it, it's coming in a circle, not in a line. Um, but I will say, yes, you're right um, about Dr. White, my predecessor, and about Haudenosaunee people in particular. Now, Haudenosaunee, people of the longhouse, y'all might have heard the term Iroquois before. Iroquois, I'm not sure of the etymology of the term. It's either French or British or Algonquin. I've heard all three, but it roughly translates as the snake people or snake in the grass. It is a derogatory term for Haudenosaunee people. Anthropologists call this the difference between emic and edic. The difference between a term that comes from inside a community versus the term that is applied to them from the outside. Iroquois or Iroquois has always been a term from outside the community. Like I said, snake people, Haudenosaunee, people of the longhouse. That's what we began uh, the land acknowledgement with. Mohawk, people of the Flint, Oneida, people of the Standing Stone, Onondaga, people of the hills, Cayuga, people of the bog or swamp. Um, Seneca, people of the hill, singular, and then the Tuscarora, the shirt-wearing people, or the people of hemp, the people of cannabis, joined the Confederacy in the early part of the 18th century. Their ancestral homelands were like current-day North Carolina. 
So for Haudenosaunee people, you're right, Liz. They want to be the respectful way to refer to them. Like my buddy Jesse visited campus a couple of weeks ago on one of those diversity grants to co-teach class with me. Jesse is Onondaga Beaver Clan. So then even further, it's Haudenosaunee, Onondaga, and then their clan identity or their clan animal, their extended kinship network that exists throughout the entire Confederacy. But Nicole and Liz, it can be very awkward to walk to, to like an, an Ungwe Hongwe person that you don't know to be like, where are you from? <laughs> Who are what nation? What clan? Like they can be very invasive questions if you haven't already established a relationship with someone. So even before you know the proper clan or nation identity, um, we run, our, we run into a problem of I'm teaching this class called Introduction to Native American Studies, but I don't know who is and who is not Native. I don't know what nations they're from. I, I don't know what clans they're from. And that's simply not something I'm going to be asking my students on day one. But I will return, Liz, to the actual question, the actual, an my version of the actual answer to the actual question of what do they like to be called? So Michael, can I ask a question? Um, yes, of course. This is Sandy. Uh, you know, I was raised in Northeastern Pennsylvania on the banks of the Susquehanna River. And, you know, I, I thought I was pretty with it because we learned all about the Iroquois Nation and the Algonquins. And so my question is, are we now, I mean, those were the maps we had, that was in our textbook. So have things changed? Because I haven't looked. Um, I mean, are we teaching Haudenosaunee instead of Iroquois? In school? Uh, Sandy, I am going to, I'm going to try and multitask. <laughs> I'm going to try and put a video in the chat. Um, it's from somebody I worked with for a long time. Her name is Denise Waterman. Um, she's Oneida, but she's worked at Onondaga for a long time. And her father was an important Onondaga chief. The reason I'm putting this video in the chat is because I can't speak for native people, but what if you can I've spent 20 plus years trying to learn from them, trying to figure out who is epistemologically a valid and good source. I consider what I consider Denise Waterman, and I just put the video in chat, to be an extremely valid and verifiable source. And if you watch this short video, which is through YouTube, um, she'll talk specifically about the difference between Iroquois and Haudenosaunee and what seems appropriate to her. Thank you. I'm not trying to dodge, Sandy, no, no, no. but I just, um, I can't answer for, for Native people themselves. Hey, it's Nicole again. I just wanted to share something that struck me as odd when you were talking about how Iroquois means snake in the grass or people of the snake. Um, I grew up in Syracuse and I was taught that it meant people of the longhouse. So that was just a, a strange thing to me that I wanted to share. Well, we used to yeah, build, long, we built longhouses in our social studies class. It's like the only thing I remember. It was pretty cool. Again, Nicole, I yeah. would, I would go for that video and no, Haudenosaunee means people of the longhouse, not, not Iroquois, even though they're referring to the same group of six nations. Are y'all too scared to use the one that's in Mohawk? It's okay if you are. <laughs> I've said it a few times. I was just going to say, I, um, I had a boyfriend for two years who was Ojibwe. Um, he was a member of the Chippewa of Nawash, which is up in southern South Canada, so pretty close to... Um, near where we are actually now in Oswego. Um, and so I spent quite a bit of time with him up on the reservation up there. And, and he used to call, they always said when I was just with them and I was sort of the only uh, white person, uh, which was a very interesting experience. And, and uh, he, they used to call themselves Indians. So that's, and that's what they told me. Thank you, Deborah. I, I <laughs> see, I, I talk in circles so much. I forget the questions that I asked. And I appreciate you bringing me back to this. Yes, the three terms that Native people use amongst themselves are Indians. And I don't mean to be offensive here, because some of you probably thought this was on the bad list. 
skins, like this is how native people refer to themselves, and ungwe hungwe. Uh, Deb or Deborah, you probably have a, you know, Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, Chippewa, like there's a different kind of terminology bracket for Ojibwe people. But for Haudenosaunee people, they use this term ungwe hungwe, in addition to Indians and skins. Indians is kind of like a colloquialism for native people you know, whereas like a skin would almost be like, hey, who's that skin over there? I don't know. I don't know them. They're not even an Indian yet. They're like on the outside almost. They're skins, but they're native. Um, ungwe hungwe is a Mohawk term. You, you pronounce K's like G's in Mohawk. Don't ask me why. And I am not a linguist. So you say this term, ung way hun way, ung way hung way, when you say it fast. And I'm not pronouncing it exactly right. And what it means is the original people or the elder people, the people of the previous generation, the originals. And so when Haudenosaunee people refer to like a larger conception of indigeneity or a larger conception of the ancestors or a larger conception of the original people of the Americas, they use this term, ungwe hungwe. So um, thank you, Deborah. Um, in private, I have never heard my Haudenosaunee friends and collaborators and co accomplices refer to themselves as Native American nor have I ever in private heard my Ungwe Hongwe friends and collaborators and accomplices refer to themselves as American Indians or First Nations. So the preferred academic terms are simply not used, or they're not prolifically used by the people themselves when they are in the majority. Now I have heard native people use those terms like when they were speaking to a non-native group or when they were speaking to an academic group or when they were speaking to a larger audience of non ungwe hongwe people. Well, I find this, I find this really interesting. And I know just as I did this, Liz, put something really interesting in the chat. Um, Cause my kid had an opportunity to go to what's called the Oneida Indian Early Learning Center. Um, his mom works at Turning Stone and managed to get him in there. It was fascinating because they learn the Oneida language, they do all these things about culture. But I, I kind of felt, I was happy to tell people he was in the center, but I felt weird about using the word Indian. But you're telling me it's, as an inside thing that they are okay uh, using that because they that's what they call the center even. Yeah, it's real complicated. Uh, it's Tim, right? Um. It's real complicated, Tim, because I mean, I don't want to say <laughs> it's the same answer I'm going to give to Liz, right? Or it's the same answer that we're going to end with. Um, so I flip between a lot of these terms and terminologies. I use almost all of them to tell you the truth when I am talking to my, my Ongwe Hongwe friends, even the really bad ones. And I'm not going to repeat to you what they call me <laughs> because we have built up that relationship over 20 years and that we have to deal with these terms and terminologies because they are so ubiquitous throughout American culture and throughout academia. Uh, Liz, you asked in the chat, is there a movement to change academic terms? It, it's hard to say, but I, I can tell you this, um, every, every scholar of Native American studies has their own piece about language and, and, and terms and terminologies. Everyone who enters into this world has to negotiate this question um, in, in public, in private, and in their professional lives. Like well, which put, terms and terminologies are they gonna use? Can I put you on the spot, Michael, here and um, ask you that if you were, if you were given sole power to name this program that you direct, what would you choose? Or not, you could pass. <laughs> um, it, it's a hard, it, it's a hard question to answer. Obviously, um, the most appropriate I would say would be Ongwe Hongwe. That would be, but my, but students wouldn't know what it was, right? Like, and and faculty wouldn't know what it was, and they would see a strange word that they couldn't. Why would why would you sign up for a class that was in a different lane? You know, it, so. But the most appropriate, if I had my druthers, sure, 
Ong Wai Hong, Department of Ong Wai Hong Wai Studies. Uh, Liz, I want to use that because this is a great conversation. But uh, before I end on the point I want to end on, can't we talk a little bit about ones you don't like? I don't want to be too basic, but um, let's talk about a few of these that are just off off the chart, not not going there, never, anyhow, anyway, inappropriate, unethical, inappropriate. Savage, I think, right? Non-civilized, savage, those are pretty bad. It's funny, Liz, because savage is one I usually have to deal with right away. Because savage is part of the contemporary popular American lexicon. Savage is part of almost all of our students' vernacular. They think it's something positive, like, um, you know, stayed up all night, got drunk, you know, boot, rally, went to my test, got a C, savage, <laughs> totally savage. So, uh, Liz, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that one out, because then how do you how do you teach a young person? Don't say that without sounding like an old person telling a young person, don't say that. And I do have an answer, Liz. Uh, just bear with me one moment while I stop and uh, restart my my screen share. Desktop two with audio. I'm sorry, my computer's a little slow going with uh, with um, with these multiple programs, but he makes it too easy. Like that's Johnny Depp and like the punchline of that Savage Dior cologne is at the very end in his raspy Johnny Depp voice. He says, we are the land. And like, it's just so ridiculous and insulting. Like this French Dior this French cologne called Sauvage with Native American dancing and drumming and symbolism. And Johnny Depp is one of those famous celebrities with a Cherokee grandmother, or who I should say, as Vine Deloria says, uh, suffers from the Cherokee grandmother complex. And it's just so stupid and insulting. And so I trace the lineage of the term back to the French anthropologist. I show him this video, uh, this this clip from Johnny Depp. And I have to say to my students, don't use this term. I understand that it's part of your vocabulary, but it is steeped in the history of anti-Indian racism. It's unavoidably steeped in the history of anti-Indian racism. So yeah, Liz, that's when I have to confront uh, head on each and every semester because it has become so ubiquitous with our students. Um, there's like hip hop artists, met multiple hip hop artists named Something Savage. Um, it's a brand of clothing. Like it's widespread um, throughout contemporary American culture. It's also used for a burn. Like when someone insults someone like really shade like, they're like, oh, totally. that's savage, right? Yeah. That's... Savage burn. Yeah. And like, that's See, I th but I also think the word savage, I think of it as more the like it's a savage dog. Like, I don't think of, I, I never even thought of that tied. You know, it's funny when that came up. That's the first thing I think it was like, I think of animals. So. Well, that's, I think savage was actually an adjective to describe behavior, right? Right, right. Yeah. Behavior, people, linguistic systems, cultural systems. Oh, sorry. I, f I forgot I stopped my share. Let me. 
Oh no, I'm still sharing, right? Yep, I can see right. it. Right on. Uh, thanks, Kat. Catherine said in in chat, uh, pagan, and then the savages. Uh, pagan, infidel, and Saracen are some of my favorites as a historian of religion. I like the old ones. I like the ones from the 14th and 15th century that then get apply, applied and reapplied to the indigenous happen, inhabitants of the Western hemisphere after um, contact in the 15th century. So pagan, Saracen, and infidel, those are three specific references to folks who have heard the messages of the gospel, folks who have heard the revelations of Jesus of Nazareth and still said, no, I don't want that. Like, no, keep that away from me. This is not something that I want. I'm going to knowingly engage in sinful behavior um, because I'm a pagan, because I'm a Saracen, because I am an infidel. Uh, what other, what other no-goes do we have here? Well, Squaw, Even, and I noticed you didn't listen, you didn't list Redskin, but like Squaw and Redskin seem to have been historical epithets, right? Yeah, Liz, I, since you like to put people on the spot, it's cool, I think. Um, <laughs> Liz, do you know what Squaw means? Um, you know, I don't, I guess I've been, you know, when it was being used, I thought it was really a term to refer to Native American whore. I, I thought it was similar to like whore, or even I'll just say it out loud, the word cunt. I thought it was a similar insult to women. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, it means cunt. Yeah. You're the first person I ever, who ever said it. I invited Dean Croyle once to class, and this was the <laughs> class I and, I and I had to start talking about Cunt Mountain and Cunt Valley and Cunt <laughs> Peak, and, and because that's what it means. It is the most derogatory way to refer to female genitalia. Like that's what it is. There's no there is no other equivalent euphemism to get to as close to what squaw means. Now I said earlier that I use all of these terms because I've known native people for 20 years and we've established these kinds of relationships. Not this one, not in any way, shape or form. Do I refer to my own way, home way, female friends with this horribly offensive derogatory terminology. Now, since Deb Holland has become the secretary of the interior, um, she has made it part of her Mission and the mission of the Department of the Interior, Deb Holland is a Laguna Pueblo woman, to remove squaw from as many federal and state place names as humanly possible. Um, you can see here uh, the historic Squaw Valley Ski Resort in Lake Tahoe. This is from uh, September 14th. But this article is from uh, May 19th, just a few days ago. State board frustrated that Wyoming has no say in renaming any location with the word squaw in it because Wyoming wants to keep it. Wyoming is quite clear that they want to keep it and they don't want, um, I don't know, woke fascists trying to take away their cunt mountain names. California bill would ban the racist term squaw in location names. This is from March 4th, the LA Times. Uh, this is the list uh, here. Fed seek new names for 28 Wisconsin geographic features. This article is from April 5th. This is the list that has been compiled by the Secretary of the Interior of all the place names in the United States that contain this derogatory term. Uh, let's go to New York. I, New York doesn't have many compared to you know some of these places. Uh, here we go. New York, Hamilton County, Nassau County, Rensselaer County. Squaw Lake, Squaw Mountain, Squaw Island, Squaw Swamp. Of course, Squaw Swamp. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't it be called Cunt Swamp? Like, because that, that makes a lot of sense. And you can see, I mean, look at Oregon. I mean, just look at Oregon. We're not even through half, you know, just hundreds, hun hundreds of place names throughout the continental United States that still have this derogatory moniker attached to it. Thanks, Liz. I do appreciate it. <laughs> we need someone to use questionable languages. I'm your gal. <laughs> Especially in the past few weeks. But. 
I will, I will, I will know that I can use you as a plant then from now on too, Liz. I appreciate that. Uh, Judy, for sure. Judy going, it's like when people use certain Yiddish terms without knowing that the term means, yeah, for sure, Judy. And, um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not scared of saying that sometimes even I use the Yiddish terms incorrectly, like machatunum. Machatunum means the relationship between like my parents and my wife's parents, but it, it doesn't, so it doesn't directly translate as in-law. There's no word in English to capture the machatunum. But so I call my in-laws my machatunum because it's just, it, it fits too much. So I do even understand um, even those of us who know the correct Yiddish, uh, sometimes we want to use those terms in a more wide ranging uh, variety and format for sure. Oh, oh, I didn't even see that. Thanks, Sean. Uh, barbarian. And barbarian, barbarian and civilized and primitive. These three terms, those come from the history of anthropology, the theory of cultural evolution, that there were three distinct categories where cultures evolved, right? From primitiveness to barbarianness to civilization. And uh, Lewis Henry Morgan, one of the early co-founders of this theory, placed Haudenosaunee people, the folks who I work with, in that middle category of barbarism or barbarianism. They weren't like primitive children, nor were they um, civilized either. Uh, Renee and, and, and Michelle, hold off, hold off. We, get, we still got to make the last point. And I will make the last point because I do know we're drawing near and we don't have time to talk about some of these other really bad ones. Uh, exotic. Subal uh, subaltern, not so bad. Exotic, Neolithic, minor. But I told Liz and I told Tim that I was going to put a pin in it and I was going to return to the actual point. What do they like to be called? If there's all these terms and terminologies and some are appropriate for, you know, academic settings, and some are appropriate for private settings, and some are appropriate for personal settings, and as Nicole said, some of them are appropriate for social media settings, then how do you know what they like to be called? And the answer, it, it is my answer, but it is a bit cyclical, and that it's, it's, it comes down to the context. The context, how well you know people, do you know native people? Have you, have you eaten a meal with native people? Have you been in, in, in native spaces, been in native people's homes? The context is everything. The, the words are more or less innocent. What is and is not appropriate? What is and is not, what is ethical and unethical? What is good and bad? depends on how invested you are in these communities, depends on how well you have established relationships of exchange with Ongwe Hongwe people. That's why, I'll use Tim's example, that's why casually referring to Indians, if you don't know any Indians, is inappropriate. That's why me saying, hey, Jesse, Buy me an Indian taco if we're at a powwow. Well, that is appropriate. It's the same word, but in a different context. Now, you all are not my students, but how I say it to my students is you talk differently with me because I'm your professor, then you talk with your friends, then you talk with your family. So you have to appreciate that this is such a complicated answer that how you might talk in one social situation, be it personal, private, or professional, might not be how you choose to talk in a different social situation. I hope that wasn't too circular, Liz. Not circular, but I guess I would like to, so to put out a context on it, I was, if I was referring to a group, if I was doing a presentation about retention rates and how they vary across subgroups, for example, and I would say, we're doing terrible for our retention of Native American students. And if students who identified in some way with that were sitting in the audience, would they think she's not even trying? Or would they think that's an acceptable term? Or that's a term that's a descriptive term. I mean, you know, clearly savages would be bad. 
but you know, it's, you know, that's, that's what I think in an audience when you're trying to, you know, and, and there's a whole issue of why you categorize, but if you're actually looking at a group and saying, this group of students needs extra help for success, and I refer to them as a group, and so we'll refer to some, you know, our Black students, you know, we're not doing as well as we should, and, and why is that, and what can we do about it, and um, I mean, it's complicated too by the fact that Native American students is a really small group as well. I mean, when we think about that too, and, and trying, but when you're in a group, when you're in a setting and you try and present, you say, it said, this is maybe an accepted academic term, but I wonder if people who, who identify in some part of that group who would, who would describe themselves differently to their friends and family, right? If they're, look, if they're listening and saying, you're not even trying to understand me. I mean, I, yeah, I understand. I, I, and I can't speak for the, the Native students who would be in the audience. I can say they would all know what you were talking about uh -huh. and some would probably be offended because of your perceived lack of context. But again, this is something I do very early on in my NAS 100 class in order to just to be able to say to my student, and I know you're not my students, <laughs> but to be able to say to my students in three months, three months from now, I hope you will have the context to be able to not feel so uncomfortable. Final thoughts or comments because I'm ready to go on mute. Um, Michael, I still, I guess I'm confused still with the, and I'm going to say it wrong, Anke Wanan. Is that like, are we using that for just this region or just for Hadnashi or is that for everybody? It's a Mohawk term. It's Mohawk. That, so that has been region. adopted. Oh. That has been adopted throughout the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So okay. you will rarely, if ever, hear native people who are not Haudenosaunee use that specific linguistic term. They have other ways, like Lakota people, the way of referring okay. to the, the elders is the Ocheti Shakowin Oyate. Like it's just a different okay. way of referring to. But it's, re so it's regional. It's Haudenosaunee specific, correct. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Sandy, it's not important, but it's Ung Wei Hun Wei. Well, I was Ongwe, writing Ongwe. my phonics down here, but I can't read my writing. Well, at the same I'm time, some, sorry. At the I'm same somebody time, who reads, go ahead, go ahead. You, you can't, that's the most appropriate way, right? Liz asked, if you want a department, what would you name it? That's what I would name it. But you can't mm -hmm. go up to a bunch of native people that you don't know, know and go, what's up my Ongwe Hongwe brothers and sisters? Because even though you're using the right term or terminology, you don't have the context. Like it would be very, it would be extremely awkward um, to say that with native people you don't know in a way. You know, it makes me think a little bit, um, I hang, I sort of hang out and mentor a lot of young black men and they can call each other the N word all the time, very endearing and lovingly, but you know, <laughs> we don't say it. <laughs> I don't say it. My family doesn't say it. Right. I'd say the word cunt before I'd say that word. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Context is everything. Yes, it, it is. is. It is. This is great. As George Carlin would tell us. <laughs> I was just going to say one quick thing that I've been sort of paying attention to the language that you've been using, Michael. And when you're referring, it seems like the one that you're using the most often is native peoples and native so it's just sort of observational that, that you yeah, I try to, to I try to not I, I try to not rest on any too many. I try to flip in between as much as I can, but um thanks, Deborah. <laughs> okay, well, this was just the beginning of a conversation. So if anyone needs any any help or any pointers or um, wants to talk about these terms and terminologies or wants to talk about lesson plans or anything else like that. Um, like I said, I teach in anthropology and Native American studies and I live in Mahar. So hope everybody has a good rest of their summer. <laughs>